It is September. It is 50 years ago. It was the greatest moment, I would think, Drago, of uh, what happened in Canadian hockey. Wherever you are, this is the Christian Athlete, My Story. Fly ball deep into right field, going and going, gone. A three-run home run. Shooting a ricochet. Oh, oh what a stop. That's an amazing save. Betsy King has won her third Nabisco Dinosaur Championship. Well, you fought off all the kids, so I'm sure the veterans are very happy. Um, I'm sure they are. You know, it's a great day for me as a Christian, too, celebrating uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But, um, you know, to win the third Dinosaur on this day makes it extra special. Heaven is a city built by jewels grand. Hello, everyone. My name is Barry Sharp, and together with Bill Wilms, thank you for joining us. We hope you'll be encouraged today as we meet with another outstanding athlete from the world of sport who enjoys a special relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hi, I'm Bill Wilms. I'm Drago Adam. Welcome to another episode of a program we call The Christian Athlete My Story. Interesting guest that we have today, Paul Henderson. It is September. It is 50 years ago. It was the greatest moment, I would think, Drago of uh, what happened in Canadian hockey. Absolutely. It, uh, no matter what age you are, you have some recollection of that. I was only six at the time. I remember being in grade one, the David Lloyd George Elementary teacher uh, wheeling in a TV in black and white, and the whole class was watching. And when that goal was scored, you just heard a scream throughout the hallways in the, in, in the school. You know, if if you weren't at living at that time or very young like yourself, Drago, honestly, you can remember where you were. I mean, it's like when they walked on the moon for the first time. It's like the Kennedy assassination. It could be like 9-11. That's how big that was. It was two systems of uh, ideology, if you will, wasn't it? Absolutely. And you know what? The, the big thing about that was you didn't even have to be a hockey fan to be drawn into it. Like, it was just... It was really communism versus our way of life, and the whole battle that was happening on the ice was actually waging around the world. Game one started in Montreal. Uh, you know, Canada did take it 2 nothing late. It ended up 7-3 Soviets, though Canada was shocked. Uh, the team was shocked. That must have been difficult. Absolutely. Uh, obviously, I think Canada just expected to lace up the skates, and we didn't know anything about who these Russians were. And it was just a rude awakening to the skill set, the skating ability, the team structure, the systems Canada wasn't ready for. They, yeah. made, a, they made a great adjustment, but boy, there was a lot of uh, eyes that were, you know, were open that, get that first game. Well, the way the team was picked, it was just like, okay, we'll put a bunch of great players together. By the way, 12 future Hall of Famers on that team. We'll put these guys together. There were guys on that team at Training Cat that didn't even like the guys that they were on competing with enemies if you will the nhl wasn't very big at that time and you didn't have a lot of light for a lot of guys a lot of egos to be handled there absolutely well i mean pulling elite athletes from teams that I mean let's face it the game of hockey back then was pretty vicious and you're going to war and there's a lot of you know like nasty stick battles and stick swinging and you know fighting and also now I'm looking across from you and we're wearing that Canada jersey yeah. and I'm supposed to like you? Yeah, exactly. All right, we're over in Russia. It's game number uh, five. Things take a big turn over there. It unites Canada. I mean, it was that big, Drago. It united Canada, the result. And by the way, we do have the guy that scored the most important goal in Canadian hockey history. We'll get to that very, very quickly. But how big was that win? Oh, I mean... The it was a bit, probably one of the biggest. It's one of the most iconic games of all, of all time, and I mean, celebrating 50 years out of it, it literally was. We'll call it the goal heard round the world. Yeah, Paul Henderson calls Pete Mahovlich off the ice with 35 seconds or less than a minute left. He wants to get out there and be that guy that scores that goal. Let's hear from him now. Barry, there are a few occurrences, uh, I guess, around the world that uh, happen where people really kind of remember exactly where they were at the moment that it happened. I guess, obviously, one of them is the assassination of President Kennedy. Another one might be uh, man's first walking on the moon. But uh, certainly for a lot of sports fans, uh, they can certainly remember the day back in 1972 when in that classic summit series between Canada and the Soviet Union, uh, with time running out in the game and the series basically tied, uh, 
Foster Hewitt screams into the microphone. Paul Henderson has scored for Team Canada, and uh, I'm sure that many of our listeners remember exactly where they were at that moment. I know I do. I know you do. And what a pleasure to have on our broadcast today uh, the architect of that winning goal at that time, uh, Paul Henderson. He's been in Vancouver uh, for a week, and Paul, it's just great to have you on our show. It's wonderful to be here. I guess I wonder, Paul, myself, a couple things. Uh, does a day ever go by in your life where where you don't think of that particular day? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, there are days go by, especially if I don't meet anybody from the public. But usually when I would meet someone from the public, uh, invariably they'll bring it up, and, of course, you're right back to 72 again. You know, I, one of the questions I guess I have, I mean, time was running out in the game. I, I don't know, uh, four or five minutes left. Uh, your line was going to go out possibly for for the last time uh, of that hockey game. Uh, what was the feeling between the three of you? Did you think you had a chance to possibly score at that point, or were you thinking more defense, keeping the other team, you know, the, the Russians from scoring the go-ahead goal? No, the last thing I th- thought of was uh, was defense. I mean, we had to score a goal. I didn't talk to anybody else, but it didn't look like we were going to get out there. There was about a minute left. Uh, it was our turn to go, but I really didn't think I was going to make it. And I stood up and started yelling at Peter Mohavlis to come off the ice, who was playing left wing. And... And uh, to this day, we don't know why he did, but he did, and it's uh, in the uh, books now. Well, it certainly was uh, an exciting time for uh, for Canada, and, uh, you know, they've had a lot of international competition since then, but, Paul, I, I think you'd agree that nothing beats the first one. It's always going to be the one that's remembered most, and uh, uh, ever since then, I think everything is uh, is sort of secondary, but what a thrill that was. Oh, it certainly was. I think there were so many unknowns. Uh, I mean, the communists were taking over the world, and, and they were challenging us in every place, and, of course, the, the one thing that we really felt uh, that we are the best in the world at, and I still think that today is hockey and of course they gave us a tremendous scare and and put us into a corner and i think produced some of the most uh, dramatic hockey we've ever seen in this country you know our program is called the christian athlete my story and uh, it's just wonderful to have you with us and uh, paul i know that uh, with all the success that that has brought you certainly mem- memorability wise and, and the opportunities for you to uh, uh, to speak etc but i know you've come to a point paul in your life where um, you've considered uh, a spiritual side of uh, of your life needed to be attended to and and you had to come to grips with who god was and who jesus christ was and uh, you have become a christian and uh, we would just like you to share possibly with our listeners uh, a little bit of your story take us back to some of your youth some of the things that happened uh, and how did this all take part well uh, i guess i got to go back to being a youngster i started practicing my autograph when i was in grade five Uh, because when I got to the NHL and I signed the name Paul Henderson, I wanted it to be legible. I wanted this, you know, this is Paul Henderson. That gives you a sort of an idea of what I wanted to do with my life. I was uh, the eldest of five kids, had a mom and dad that loved me, and my childhood was was rather uncomplicated. Grew up in a small Ontario town. But by the time I was 14, I basically thought I had life figured out. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to have money. Uh, the only hassles that we seem to have in our families is the fact that we are poor. And I thought, boy, if you just had money, then, you know, half these problems would go away. Obviously, I wanted to be an athlete at first choice, uh, find something I really enjoy doing and get paid well, and then, of course, have a good family life. And so those were my pursuits. And I uh, liked school and uh, being involved in school and sports and working after school. Never really uh, had a chance to get into much trouble, really. And, And it worked out fairly well. Uh, Married my high school sweetheart, turned pro at Detroit in 1963 uh, after winning the Memorial Cup, actually, as uh, Canada's top junior team in Hamilton in 1962. And uh, uh, started playing with Detroit and my great hero, Gordie Howe, and and, uh, then traded to the Toronto Maple Leafs. And uh, I think everybody should have an opportunity to play for the Toronto Maple Leafs. You skate out there on Saturday night, and especially back then there was only six teams in the league, and knew that half the country was watching. It was a pretty good thrill. And then, of course, 72 came along and uh, challenged by the Russians, and I was fortunate to be asked and got to play and uh, and did quite well. Ended up scoring the winning goal in each of the last three games and came back, was a toast to Canada. And my friends would say, you know, Henderson, you're one of the luckiest guys alive. And, and as I looked at myself, maybe slowed down to take a look at it for the first time, I was 29. Uh, I was doing something I always wanted to do, playing in the NHL, been there nine years, enjoyed the career. My wife and family enjoyed the life and member of the country club and loved to play golf in the summertime. The WHA had come along and the future even looked rosier than the past. And now I was even a sort of somewhat of a hero in this country. And 
Uh, but inside, I wasn't content, and I started asking questions. And my wife and children went to church, but I really wasn't that much of a... Uh, I didn't have a really what you would call a spiritual dimension to my life. I was more a worldly type person than that. Uh, but anyway, I, I started looking into it. Actually, I worked with a man for about two and a half years. And, and after two and a half years of frustration and, and trying to find answers, I, I really came to believe that there was a God that loved Paul Henderson very much, that wanted to have a personal relationship with me. I understood also uh, the reason that I wasn't content at this point in my life, and even though I had everything basically that a man could want, I was separated from God because of the way I'd lived my life. Now, I certainly wasn't a bad guy or anything, but I'd, I'd basically said to God, you go your way and I'll go mine. I'll run my ship the way I want to. And, and this uh, man showed me that the, the consequences of that was eternal separation from God. Uh, but even though I was in this predicament, I did nothing to deserve it, but God loved me, Paul Henderson, so much. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay the penalty for Paul Henderson's sin. And for the first time, that was personal. You know, I understood that, boy, he died for me. And, and, and I had three daughters and a, and a good family. And boy, to love somebody to die for them, that was incredible. And then he also explained to me I could either accept his love or I could reject it. And the way that I could accept it was to ask God to forgive me of the things that I had done wrong. And boy, I had, you know, I had a lot of things in my slate. And I needed to ask him into my life as my Lord and Savior. And I really needed to believe it, and I needed to mean it. And so in 1975, at the spring of 1975, I said a simple little prayer. I said, Lord God, I really do believe you are who you say you are. I, I understand that I've done many, many things wrong, but yet I understand that you love me and, and sent your son to die in my place. And so I ask you to forgive me of all the things I've ever done. I asked your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into my life as my Lord and Savior and, and told him that he was going to have to make me the person that he wanted me to be because I certainly couldn't do it. And in the very same breath, I said, don't you ever expect me to tell anybody about this. I'm going to be one of those <laughs> secret service guys. And uh, But, you know, it's sort of ironic. Uh, uh, and, you know, when I look back, I, I had really, I had three, I wanted to become a Christian several months before I did, but I had three problems. I was worried about ridicule. You know, what are the people going to say? You know, there were no high-profile Christians back then. There were no Danny Barretts or McManuses or Ryan Walters or uh, Pinball Clemens or, you know, John Wetland, the MVP of the World Series last year, uh, and or Stu Grimson or Mike Gartners. And uh, I thought, boy, that, you know, this is really narrow. And I thought, boy, everybody's going to make fun of me. The second reason I had struggled, I, I looked at Christianity as do's and don'ts. And, uh, and I thought that a lot of the don'ts were the things that I like to do. And I thought, boy, this is really going to be narrow. You know, how can you really be a man's man and be a Christian? And then the third reason, of course, is that I read by this time, if you really love the Lord, you, you need to make a stand for him. You know, let people know where you are. Well, you know, there was no chance. And so, but anyway, I was finally able to, to just uh, with much fear and trepidation, be able to step over the line and say, even though these are concerns, I'm going to give my life to you. Now, since 1975, God has been filled in the gaps. I uh, was really fortunate to have an excellent mentor when I first became a Christian, got into a good church, got into a good discipleship group, became a student of the Word of God, and, uh, and it really blossomed. My wife gave her life to the Lord shortly after I did. Even though that she had been a church-going person, she was going to get to heaven by being a good person. But after she saw the difference in me, she just said, you know, there's something different about you. I can see it in your eye and just your whole deportment. And so she got into the Bible, and, and, and she prayed to receive the Lord as her Savior. And then that summer, our oldest girl, Heather, was 12, sent her to a Christian camp. She came home and told us that Christ was in her heart and shared with her two younger sisters. And the fall of 1975, the whole Paul Henderson family uh, became Christians. And, uh, and it's uh, been had a tremendous impact in our life since. We've now got uh, a couple of uh, uh, son-in-laws and four grandchildren and, uh, and, and who love the Lord. So it's terrific. Paul, you talk about um, uh, receiving Christ as your Savior. You know, uh, I've heard there's a picture painted. I don't know who uh, the artist was, but it's a picture of Christ knocking uh, on a door. And um, the artist was asked, I mean, you, it's a wonderful picture. There's a door, there's Jesus knocking on it, but there's no handle on the outside of the door. And uh, had you forgot to put the handle on the door? And the artist said, no. He said, the handle is on the inside. And even though Christ knocks on the, on the heart's door of people, 
we still have to open the door from the inside. He doesn't push it down. He doesn't barge into your life. He, he asks to come in. We have to open it. And it's just something that, uh, that you have experienced. And, and it's just uh, wonderful to, uh, uh, you know, to, to hear that. Paul, people out there that might be listening, that might say, well, listen, I would like to have what, uh, what Paul Henderson's experienced. Uh, what would you tell them? I would encourage them to, to find someone that they know that does love the Lord. I think it's very difficult to get there on your own. I know that I needed much help. Uh, the second thing I would try to find is a good Bible-believing church, uh, somewhere where the Word of God is, uh, is held in high esteem. And, and, and there are answers. And I would just encourage people to go out and find answers, ask questions, and, uh, and pray to the Lord. Just simply, Lord, I don't know whether you're real or not, but you reveal yourself to me. And God is faithful, and it'll happen. Well, you're absolutely right, Paul, and uh, I know uh, a competitor uh, that you are. I've had the opportunity to play with uh, with Paul Golf on the golf course, and let me tell you, just because he's a Christian and, and doing the, the work of the Lord, and uh, I'm sure instrumental in leading others to uh, to the Lord, uh, Barry, I can tell you, this guy's as competitive as ever. He's on the golf course. He's out to beat your socks off, and uh, you don't have to be a, kind of a wimp just because you're a Christian, and it's just been wonderful having him on our show. At this time, we would like to keep our good friend Paul Henderson and his family in our prayers. As we have learned, Paul is now battling with severe health issues. Wonderful interview with Paul Henderson. Wonderful sharing. And I might mention this real quick. He is uh, not in very good health as we speak. So we ask those people that uh, would like to pray for him. I'm sure he'd uh, appreciate that. But uh, very interesting, some of the com comments that he made. Uh, what was your thoughts? The, uh, the interesting thing is, you know, you just go back to that, that time and place where he just scored those three game-winning goals, and then obviously the, one of the biggest goals probably in history. And you would think you'd be on the pinnacle of success. You know, you're an NHL hockey player. You just received national, worldwide fame. Mm -hmm. Got a very beautiful family, and yet he's feeling that that wasn't enough. Like, what's, what's next? feeling this, this hollow, empty kind of experience, I think most people will find that shocking. And, and that can happen in any walk of life, too, can it? Absolutely. I think, I mean, it's quite common. We hear about that from athletes who have achieved the, let's talk about Tom Brady, for instance, after he won his Super Bowls, he was like, really? Is that all there is? Is that all there is? Yeah, no, that, that's, and, and Paul did find the answers that he was searching for, and um you're right. I mean, I, I played golf with him. He, he's he's a competitor as can be. He'll try to beat you every which way he can. And, uh, you know, he came to a point where he didn't, uh, he felt ridiculed, that there could be ridicule. He thought there was more to it than that, a bunch of do's and don'ts. And it's exactly not that, isn't it? And the thing that impressed me as much as anything in that whole situation, or you know, to put a, a conclusion on this, he talked about the painting of the door, Christ knocking, Jesus Christ knocking on the door, and there's no handle on the door, and the artist was asked, uh, had he forgot to put the handle on, and the artist said, no, it's on the inside. We do have to open that door. To It's not going to be barged down. The Lord's not going to barge his life, the door down to get in our life. No, absolutely. I think that's, uh, you know, kind of a common, common thing is you hear People say, well, you know, if God's real, then why doesn't he just make us all believe in him? And, you know, I mean, without getting into the whole aspect about free will and everything, I, I think that's just not loving. If we take a look at God, at who he is, at his base nature, he's love. God is all about love. And would that be a loving thing to make you, me, or anybody else believe in him without actually having the choice to, to come to Or, as you said, open the door from the inside? Yeah. You know, he loves you so much that he will actually let you turn away from him if you want. That is the love that God has for us. And uh, enjoyed it immensely having you again, Drago. And thanks again for watching. And uh, our website? Well, it's uh, our website is uh, thechristianathletemystory.com. And I would just uh, take a moment to encourage people, Bill, that... You know, no matter where you are in life, if you're if you're sincerely wondering, mm -hmm. is there a God? Is He real? Does He exist? The one thing that I can speak emphatically about is that just sincerely ask. Take a moment, get into a quiet room, or step outside on a walk, and just say, Lord, if you're real, would you reveal yourself to me? Because I want to know you. And trust me, I think it will, will happen. Yeah, well said.